before we begin, we're going to allow a few moments of silent time where you can pray and represent yourself before the throne of grace. It's a time to use the rebound technique if needed. 1 John 1 9 says this If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So let's bow our heads together for a few moments and I'll finish this out in a group prayer. Excuse me. Ephesians 5, 6, I want to read it in my New King James and then we'll exegete. It says, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Let's take a look at it. Ephesians 5, 6 starts out with, let no man deceive you. It is from the Greek, apatao. It means to seduce, to cheat, or to mislead. To seduce into error, and therefore to deceive by false teaching. To entice. With it is medes which is composed of two words, meaning not even one or no one. Literally, let no one deceive you. Um, I've got something I want to share with you because false doctrine is more common than true doctrine, and I don't know if you know that or not. And Satan loves to incorporate false ideas into a true theme. And so he tricks uh, believers into all kinds of uh, things. The present tense here means that into your life sooner or later is going to come something which is false, contrary to the teaching of the word. If you are deceived by this, then you are taken into reversionism. Just like the idea, a lot of people are turning against the Jew and turning against Israel right now. And uh, they have no idea what God has promised them in the Palestinian covenant and how much restraint that they are showing with their military. You're often deceived by association with a reversionist. He gives you a little human viewpoint. He says something that is not true, but you buy it because of your association with him, or maybe you respect this person. Therefore, if you're led into reversionism, not by the unbelieving pimp in the temple, which the Ephesians were being seduced by, but by your dear Christian friend, who's all mixed up with regard to Bible doctrine, and is actually losing out in the Christian life. The active voice means uh, they're producing the action of the verb of not being deceived by this false teaching. The imperative mood is the imperative of prohibition used to express a negative command. Well, there's all kinds of false doctrine out there. Uh, I've made an issue out of telling you about uh, our views of Israel and uh, what's going on in the world, but uh, also this song, I don't know who Jelly, Jelly Roll is. That is a name of an entertainer slash slave. But uh, he has come out with a new song. Maybe it's a she, I'm not sure. I heard it come across the radio the other day, and this is uh, a perfect example of how 
Satan uses, he incorporates just enough truth into something to get your attention and then lead you astray. Uh, so here, Jelly Roll is very confused. I want to read some of these lyrics to you. It says, I'm a county jail revival. I'm a bottle and a Bible. I'm a rolling stone disciple with a cross across my face. I'm a trailer park tornado, jagged edges on my halo. Hope the chariot gonna swing low and carry me away. This little light of mine damn near burned me alive. Lord knows that my mama tried, and I don't know if I'm halfway to heaven or halfway to hell. My angels and demons at war with myself. Now, that phrase right there needs some explanation because, first of all, you're either absolutely born again or you're absolutely not. You're not halfway anywhere. And once you've believed in Christ, God the Holy Spirit takes you out of Adam and places you in Christ where you can never lose your salvation. You are a child of God. And so there's no halfway in between. There's an absolute. You're absolutely going to hell because you're an unbeliever or you're absolutely going to heaven because you have expressed faith in Jesus Christ at some point in your life. And then it says, my angels and demons at war with myself. Well, you don't have angels and demons. And he's very confused about this because angels are demons and demons are angels. And what he, what he was uh, probably trying to express that maybe elect angels or maybe fallen angels were somehow at war inside his soul. But that's a false concept because you are being tempted to sin by, your, by the trends in your own sin nature. And whether you're under temptation to sin in your own area of weakness where you're, you're personally tempted or whether you are under uh, pressure to do human good in your own area where you produce Filthy rags. See, that's all you. And Satan would just as soon you not sin at all and that you spend the maximum amount of your time whitewashing his world. And Satan seeks to produce a utopia on earth right now that is good enough that we don't need Jesus Christ to come back. And when you see things um, going towards a one-world government and universal health care and all of these things, that's exactly, the, you know, who's behind it, Satan himself. And so when you see lyrics like this, this song comes across the radio in my shop at least three times a day. And... Uh, I'm walking by and my employees are singing it. And I just think to myself, I hope they've got a great pastor. Because as much false doctrine is being pounded into their souls, they're going to have to have an adequate amount of truth to flush it out. And that's the tragedy that the world we live in is that if I walked up to somebody on the street and I said, can you can you uh, reproduce your favorite Bible verse to me? Um, or if I started the music to this song, they could probably repeat the lyrics to a song full of false doctrine before they could reproduce as many words of the Word of God. So... False doctrine is prevalent in our society. 
You have my PowerPoint back now, Jim. Okay, good. The next phrase then is, or you, or you all, is the pronoun su. It refers to every member of the royal family of God. It should be translated, let no one be deceiving you all. With vain words is the next phrase. It's the adjective kanos, which means empty, without content, without truth, without power. Plus the noun logos, or words or thoughts, thoughts expressed. Should be translated by means of empty words. Empty words are the means by which you, in association with a reversionistic believer, enter into reversionism yourself. So empty words do have power. They have the power to deceive you, to lead you astray. They have the power to present to you something that is attractive. And in effect... Your dear Christian friends who are in reversionism are compared now to the Ephesian pimps. They are the pimps drawing you into false doctrine, drawing you into various stages of reversionism. And um, I tell you, a big false doctrine that's going around prevalent in our society is be kind. Be kind. And it, that is a concept in the Word of God, that uh, you be kind to one another, and what it is is a grace mental attitude towards other believers. But uh, it, the, the whole ideology of the religion of the world right now is just be nice to one another. Just be kind to one another. And that if we'll all just be nice to each other, then somehow we can get along. And uh, But the truth is that Jesus both was kind and compassionate, but he also flipped over the money changer's table. He also made a cord, a whip of cords, and he chased uh, people out of the temple. And so you have to understand that in the Christian way of life, you must follow the leadership of the Spirit, whether it's being kind and compassionate and having a grace mental attitude towards those who don't deserve it, or whether you're flipping over the money changer's table and you're making a whip of cords. See, it's not always kindness. And uh, so when I'm, when I'm being direct and I say something, you will burn in eternal hell fire if you don't receive Jesus Christ as Savior. Where there will be gnashing of teeth and the worm dieth not. You'll receive a body of damnation that will burn for all of eternity. And the only hope for you to escape it is to have Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Lamb from God, and His blood, His substitutionary spiritual death, covering you. You see, that's not received by the unbeliever well, but it's absolute truth. And I can say it with dogmatism, because it's truth from the Word of God. And so, therefore, our society has received a great lie in the fact that they don't want any dogmatism. It might be uh, offensive, but God requires it. He requires the John the Baptist of the world to call a snake when he sees a snake and to say truth even though it may be offensive. And uh, as I told you Wednesday night, I'm not here to make friends. And uh, I stand with the Word of God. Moses and Elijah are going to come back and bodies that are resuscitated in the tribulation, and they're going to stand in downtown Jerusalem, and they're going to preach, and uh, people are going to shoot at them. And they're not going to die, but 
they're going to get shot at. And the Bible says that nobody can kill them. Nobody can shut them up. And then finally, at the midpoint of the tribulation, uh, they will be overcome. But look, they weren't into a popularity contest. They're there to preach the truth and get shot at. And so, beware, beware of the cosmic evangelist giving you false doctrine. The next word is for, it's gar. It expresses the reason for all of this. Because of these things is dia plus the pronoun altos. Because of these false doctrines, because of the false things, cometh. I love that word in the King James. It always reminds me of when Jesus told the Pharisees, the Son of Man, the Son of Man cometh on the clouds of heaven with great glory. Oh, it burned them up. They didn't like hearing that all. He cometh. Well, something else that is coming here, it's a present active indicative, erkomai. To the believer seduced into reversionism, he is deprived of blessing in time. The present tense is regarded as very certain. It is going to happen. And therefore, the present tense indicates it will come to pass. The active voice, the indicative mood is declarative, indicating an absolute. So something is coming. And remember what I told you, once a son, always a son. You can't lose your salvation. You can be a prodigal. And you can be out in the Thule's. What's coming for you then? The wrath of God, thumas, or not, excuse me, it's not thumas here, it's orge, another word for anger. By the way, uh, God is not angry. Anger is a mental attitude sin. And so this is an anthropopathism. It's a human emotion that is ascribed to God, which he does not actually possess, but is used to teach a principle of divine essence. In other words, God the Father's righteousness is offended by the reversionistic false doctrine in the mind of the believer. And therefore, his justice swings into action. And what does his justice produce for the prodigal son? Divine discipline. That's going to be my uh, the next phrase. Towards the children of disobedience and so you in your christian way of life you may resist doctrine and you may get out in the toolies you may be in a faraway land but if you're born again you won't get away with it okay the bible tells us that the carnal believer looks just like an unbeliever on the outside you can't look at their life until they're born again at all So in Hebrews 12, 2 through 6, I want to uh, show you what the Bible teaches about the believer that's in a faraway land. The writer of Hebrews says this, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord. So you got to stop. If you're miserable, you have to stop and ask yourself, what has been my attitude towards Bible doctrine? That will be the number one indicator of the fact that the pain that you're experiencing is divine discipline or another form of adversity. Nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. 
chasteneth and scourges. The word scourge here is skin alive. Scourgeth every son whom he received. That's generic for every believer. If you endure chastening, divine discipline, God dealeth with you as sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then you are bastards and not sons. So, as this is for the unbeliever who's out there who's probably religious, and um, they're out there working, you know, overtime, and they're old man, and they think their sins are hidden, but they're not. They're, there's no discipline in their life. He's saying, stop and have a question mark. Why are you? Why do you think you're getting away with it? when in fact, you're not even a son. And so there's a ton of people out here who are working for salvation. And nine out of ten Christians believe in some form of works-oriented salvation. In other words, they're trying to be good enough. They're trying to give enough money. They're, they're going through psychological hoops like walking the aisle or praying the sinner's prayer or tearing at the mourner's bench or crying tears of repentance. See, these people are unbelievers. They're trying, to, they're, they're trying to work their way to heaven, and you can't do it. You have to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And so, while they're religious on one hand, they're also locked into their old man on the other. They've got no option. So they're not sons. Furthermore, we had fathers of our flesh, that means your human father, which corrected us. You see that, dads? What's our job? We have to figure out our child's discipline language. What do they respond to as far as discipline? And we gave them reverence. That means we saluted. Yes, sir. And... Uh, my dad was one who you had to tighten up on. You had to tighten up around, and there was there was no goofing off on Sunday, even though it was the Lord's day of day of rest, as he said. But uh, if you didn't tighten up around the dinner table on Sunday, whoo, he'd teach you how to tighten up. And I was thankful for every bit of discipline that I received from him even though some of it was skewed because he taught me this principle. He said, children, I've been hard on you, but life is hard. And therefore, he taught us how to tighten up under authority. And so many kids don't know how to do it. And uh, you must, at times, you must stand still and you must salute. And... Uh, it says, we gave them reverence. I know exactly what that is. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? In other words, we moved out from under the authority of our father, our mom and dad at home, and now we're out in the world as free people, but we're now to salute the authority that is in heaven. And uh, that's a hard transition for believers to make, to move out from under the umbrella of the mother, father and mother's authority in the home and to move out in life under the invisible authority of God. For they, that is our human fathers, verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure or uh, impulse but he for our profit that is God disciplines us for our profit that we might be t partakers of his holiness in other words what's what this is God doesn't punish us for our sins Christ took that punishment he gives us divine discipline 
so that we might grow up in our Christian lives, become more and more like Christ. Now, no chastening for the present seem joyous. Well, I can tell you that. But grievous, being skinned alive with a whip, is not joyous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. In other words, God's discipline towards a believer always has a purpose, and it's to drive us back, get us back in fellowship, just like the prodigal son returned home, to get us returned back to fellowship and get us back growing more and more like Jesus Christ every day. So the children of disobedience... A preposition, F-E, plus the accusative plural of weas, which is on the sons. With it is the descriptive of apetheia, which means disbelief or unbelief. Now this word apetheia is used in two different contexts. You can either be in disbelief that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. And my Jewish friends just call him the carpenter. That's their term of derision. They call him the carpenter. And some would say that Jesus was just a prophet or just a good man. So they're in unbelief as far as Christ is concerned being Savior. So they can be an unbeliever. But also it's used for the believer. And it's used for the wayward child of God. I want to show you a few verses in Hebrews where the same word is used. Unbelief, apatheia, is used in context of believers. Now, I want to, okay, I got to tell you part of the story then. So when the Hebrews were in Egypt, God used Egypt as an incubator. And 70 some odd people went in and 2 million came out. So the Jewish population exploded in Egypt. And after 400 years, God says, okay, I'm going to lead you out to the promised land. And so we know that because of the day of Passover, where every father in the household had to take the blood of the lamb and he had to paint it over the doorpost of the house. And see, that is Christ, our Passover, whose blood covers us from God's judgment. You got it? Every Hebrew household had the blood of the lamb, believing household. And... So we know that because these Hebrews had been through the Passover, that they were all born again. And now here they are, and God's leading them out. And he opens the Red Sea, and he lets them part, dry shot. They cross, and what happens? The Egyptian army gets covered up. And uh, Moses declares, my God is a God of war. And... Uh, he had neutralized the most powerful army in the world in one maneuver. And so all the Hebrews, adult, that came out of Egypt were born again sons of God. But it says here that they continued in unbelief. And what was it? They didn't use the faith rest drill. When they saw God deliver them from the Egyptian army, they should have said to themselves, if God can do that, I will never be concerned again. He can do anything. And yet what happened? They didn't go out a little piece, a little ways, right out in the wilderness, and God led them into a no-water situation, and what did they do? They complained. And they picked up stones and they're about ready to kill Moses. 
And God tells Moses, get out right out there in front of them and make a good target. And uh, what did he do? He had to hit the rock with his staff. And the rock there was Christ. And hitting the rock with the staff represented the judgment of the cross. And uh, water came forth. And they watered themselves and their animals. And so... They didn't believe. And you go through and you look at um, Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and you find out that they went through test after test in the wilderness and they failed and they failed and they failed. And so when you see this uh, verse in Hebrews, it is pointing to the Exodus generation. And it says in Hebrews 4, 6, Seeing therefore, therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein. And that's the place of rest. For the Hebrews it was trusting God, the faith rest drill that led them into the promised land. And there was only two that did it. Caleb and Joshua. They said, God will overcome for us. He will allow us to beat the giants. He will allow us to take the land. Nobody else agreed with them. And they to whom it was first preached entered not because of apatheia, unbelief. They did not use the faith rest drill. They should have said when God brought us across the Red Sea, he can do anything and we're going to trust him all the way into the promised land. They didn't do it. It says, let us labor therefore at, to enter into that rest. <coughs> what is the sphere of rest for you? That says that you also can receive the rest, even in this life. What is it? It's the faith rest drill. It's God saying this, if while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, how much more then will God do for us as sons? If he sent his son to the cross while we were his enemies to deliver us, how much more will he do for us after salvation? And the answer is, he'll do anything and everything for you. You're the object of his love now. You have his own righteousness. It says, let us labor, therefore. That means there's going to be some work involved. And that means you've got to get some doctrine in your soul. That means you've got to get a promise for every situation. That means that, like I told you, every day God's mercy is renewed. And that when our feet hit the floor in the morning, we say, thank you, Father. I know you've got a wonderful day planned for me. It's going to be full of, of uh, good things, and it's also going to be opportunities for me to flex my spiritual muscle. And I just want to start off by thanking you for it. And we walk in God's grace, and we trust him every day that he gives us. And we may not get the next, but we trust God in the day we're in. It says, let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. That's the sphere of the faith rest drill. Lest any man fall after the same example of the Hebrews in unbelief. They didn't trust God. They, what did they do? They maribod. I love that word. Because they complained. They griped. They uh, threw a hissy fit. And they were very childish. And they couldn't trust God. Even in the smallest situations. All they could see was their own predicament. Why don't you slow down and look at the Hebrews for a moment and ask yourself, what area of my life can I need to trust God in? And I'm telling you right now, you're living in the United States, you better learn a new method of trusting God. Our country is headed downhill like a snowball headed for the flames. And God's taking home patriots faster than you can imagine. I think it's because he doesn't want them to have to endure seeing their country go down. It's such a, it's a, it, 
you don't call it sad, but it's 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 something to watch a country that was we hadn't even made it three hundred years, once the greatest country in the modern world, and we got this freedom, this wonderful thing that was paid for by patriots, the blood of patriots. Well, we have so much freedom, and to watch it go down, I think God's bringing them home so they don't have to see it. You better learn how to trust God in the United States of America. And you better learn this, that while you see the news, and while you see the tornadoes, and while you see the earthquakes, and while you see the wildfires, and you see the violence, and you see the poverty, you better understand that all of these things are not the cause, but they are the effects of a shrinking pivot. The salty believer is becoming fewer and fewer, and we are not replacing them in the pulpit. See, it's the pastor's job to haul the salt out and teach it to his congregation. And so, when we see the shrinking pivot, we know that the pressure's coming up. And uh, if we ever replace those people and we start doing our jobs as pastors and we start getting mature believers moving in there, you're going to see the scales of God's justice change. And you're going to start seeing blessing in America. But since we're not mentioned in biblical prophecy, you have to wonder, what if we're in a historical trend and we're going down and we're ever going to make it back up? That's the question. Let us labor, therefore, to enter that rest. We're going to trust God with our country. We're going to do our own job in adding ourselves to the pivot. See, there's the labor. We're going to do what we can control, and we're going to trust God in the rest. That's the faith rest drill. Lest any man fall after the same example of their apatheia, unbelief. You've got to learn. There's 6,000 promises in the Word of God. You need to learn a promise for every situation that you run into in life where you can trust God. The preposition epi plus the accusative plural of weos, which is sons, it's the descriptive genitive to see what kind of sons are involved. It's the descriptive genitive of apatheia. So here is your corrected translation. Let no one be deceiving or seducing you by means of empty words or false doctrine, doctrine of demons. For because of these things, the wrath of God, that's divine discipline, is coming upon the sons of disobedience or disbelief. And so you can apply this to two different things. The unbeliever, he's, he's in danger because he doesn't know how long his life is going to last. And if he dies without believing in Christ, without accepting Christ as Savior, the judgment day is coming. And he's going to go to torments, which is a holding area for unbelievers until the great white throne at the end of the millennium. And then he'll be cast into the lake of fire. And so the wrath of God is coming towards the person who is unbelief. And that's the idea. Torments, great white throne, hellfire. But there's also category number two, and that is for the believer the prodigal sons who are out in a faraway land and uh, the, their famine is coming. See, they had, they had fun for a while and there's pleasure in sin for a season. But if you're a believer, you're not going to get away with it. You're just like the dog who's running on the cable and he's chasing the car 
because he loves it. But he's going to hit the end of that cable. And that's how the believer is running away from God, out in carnality, functioning under the flesh. Okay, we're going to look at the doctrine of divine discipline next. But let's take a break right here. It might be matured, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show thyself an approved workman unto God who needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. We're about to um, begin the doctrine of divine discipline. We've seen that uh, unbelievers are not liable for this category of suffering. And that uh, in the Christian life there are five different categories of which all suffering may be put in. And first... I want to take you through them because you need to recognize that first of all, there is the law of volitional responsibility. And that means that you reap whatever you sow. And if you sow into the wind, you shall reap the whirlwind. In other words, there are certain things which you may do in life which there are results and uh, including uh, you can commit suicide rather slowly and uh, there are certain peoples who have human bodies who who are uh, will not tolerate abuse and uh, whether you're in alcoholism or drug abuse um, or whether you just uh, have a, a lot of bad life choices you can actually end your life before God had planned and you can make so many bad choices concerning your human body that uh, you can physically die. Now here's the truth. If God sovereignly decides that I need you here longer than that, guess what? He can overrule it. And I'll never forget, me and my friends, we had gone to the rock quarry in Hollywood and we were jumping off the cliff and uh, the water was only like six, seven foot deep, and we were jumping off 30, 40 foot cliff, and we would hit the bottom, and it was kind of mud on the bottom, and we'd hit it really hard, but it didn't hurt, because we just, poosh, you know, kind of landed in the mud. Let's do it again, and we kept going higher and higher and higher, and we, we never died, and never got hurt, and then we got in the truck to go home, and we're, um, Riding, you know, there's if you ever been to the Rock Quarry in Hollywood, you know, there's a big hill right there when you're going into the gate. There was two rabbits at the bottom, and uh, we said, Mike, run over those rabbits. And we were in a 69 Chevrolet truck and had a V8 three speed on the column, and he gunned it. And we began to peel gravel and fly down the hill. And we were pointed dead at one rabbit, and the rabbit shot into the ditch. And he saw the other rabbit. Well, he turned for it. Well, at that point, he had panicked, and his foot was planted on the floorboard. And that rabbit shot towards the ditch. And so then we were in the death wobble. And um, the, the road is really wide there. Uh, but we were sliding sideways from side to side wide open in the 69 chevy truck and we made about the third sideways pass and there was a rock sticking up in the road and the back rim caught that rock and it launched that truck in a barrel roll we did the first one in the air and here we are with three teenage kids boys no seat belt on whatsoever. We barely, we had our swim trunks on. I think that's all we were wearing. And I've got my arm out uh, the window like this in the first row we did in the air. And I know that for a fact that my guardian angel had his hand on my head holding me in. And when we hit the ground, the first row went by and my face laid against the gravel road as we rolled that truck over. And then we rolled again. I saw the gravel come by again. I could almost pick out the rock that went by. And we finally landed on all four 
And we all looked at each other and went like this. Y'all hurt? No. I'm good. I can't believe we ain't dead. Well, God overruled our stupidity. And I'm. And I'll, we'll find out when we get to heaven how many times he protected us in these ways. So there is the law of volitional responsibility. We can make bad decisions and we will suffer the consequences. And many times in life, we torture ourselves so badly under category number one that God never has to get around to category two. That's divine discipline. In other words, we, we beat ourselves up. And God says, well, they're done doing such a fine job. I think I'll just relax. But if the prodigal son gets at the right point in his cable is nearing the end of uh, running, chasing the cars, there is category number two, and that's divine discipline. And we never know when it's going to hit. For Ananias and Sapphira, it was the first sin. They lied to the Holy Spirit, and God killed them dead right there. And, but for, for Saul, he, he lived for 40 years under divine discipline, and the misery was so intense that he actually went insane. And so we don't know if it's going to be 40 years or the very moment. But God has three categories of divine discipline. We're going to look at them. Three stages. Category uh, three, four, and five of Christian suffering are suffering for doing right. And category number three is providential preventative suffering. It's the thorn in the flesh. And if you grow far enough in the Christian life, you might uh, have a potential of becoming arrogant because now you understand why you're alive and why God created mankind. And you uh, overcome all the false doctrines that most people are suffering under. And you might become prone to arrogance. And so God sends you a thorn in the flesh, not only to keep you humble, but to teach you how to cleave to divine strength. God's not interested in human power. He's interested in his own power in you. And so, if you grow far enough, you receive providential preventative suffering. It's something that's not going to go away. And so, um, it is. it stays with you right until the end. And... Uh, so category number four is called momentum testing. It's the believer in the desert where he'll go through eight categories of tests. They're warm-ups uh, to maturity. And if the believer ta uh, pass these eight tests, the people test, the thought test, the system test, the disaster test, the prosperity test, the old sin nature test, temptations from cosmic one, temptations from cosmic two. Cosmic one is the arrogance complex of sins. It represents Satan's attitude in eternity or before human history. And then the hatred com complex of sins represent Satan's attitude during the angelic conflict. So eight different tests that the believer will take before God allows them to be decorated for maturity and the fifth category of Christian suffering. And that is providing evidence, it's called evidence testing, in the appeal phase of Satan's trial. In other words, you as a believer, you're here to glorify God in your Christian life. And what God needs is be able to point to you and look at Satan and say, now have you noticed my servant, my person down here? 
You haven't been able to trip them up, Satan. And they're willing to live my plan for their life, even though they can't see me. Now, why couldn't you? Why couldn't you? And so that the believer provides evidence for the prosecution in the appeal phase of Satan's trial. You, believer, are supposed to take the witness stand to the effectiveness of God's grace in the angelic conflict. God's not going to let you get cross-examined by Satan until you're ready for it. In other words, Satan seeks to sift you like wheat. He wants you to take the witness stand because he knows you're not ready. So, he prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And the lion can't devour the mature believer. So, five categories of Christian suffering. First, volitional responsibility. Second, divine discipline. Third, providential preventative suffering. Fourth, momentum testing. And fifth, evidence testing. Well, we're going to be looking at <clears throat> category number two, divine discipline. What is it? Who's liable for it? And what's its, what's its purpose? What is divine discipline's purpose? So let's take a look at the doctrine of divine discipline. So we've seen our verse in Hebrews that said, we had fathers that gave us correction. They taught us discipline. And there's lots of ways that if you, okay, if you got a kid and they're raised by a single parent, maybe it's the mom. Maybe they're not the greatest at teaching discipline. But God has things in uh, motion where they can still learn discipline. Maybe it's a school teacher that makes them stand in line. Maybe it's a, it's a PE coach who teaches them how to exercise on command. Maybe it's an athletic coach. Maybe it's a pastor. Maybe it's a Sunday school teacher. Uh, so there are different areas where a child can learn discipline and the issue of a child learning discipline is who to respect and so the principle the axiom of doctrine comes forth you do not spoil your child by what you give them you can only spoil a child by not teaching them respect in other words you take them into church you say there's the pastor. We're going to respect him. You're out on the street. You say, there's the policeman. He represents the law. We're going to respect him. You go to school. You say, there's the teacher. You're going to listen to them, and you're going to do what they say. You're going to respect them. So on and so forth. And that is how you teach a child not to be spoiled. A child can have every means of wealth and riches, but they will not be spoiled unless they're not taught respect. And so, when you see divine discipline, it is respect for God. It's from God. It's His authority. And we're saluting Him. His discipline towards us is as a loving father. He doesn't want us to be spoiled. He wants us to be respectful in all areas. And therefore, he's teaching us discipline. He's teaching us how to salute his word. How to have reverence, respect for the things that are noble in life. And so, there's no father who doesn't want to see his children succeed in life. And a father teaches his children 
to respect authorities in life. And God is going to teach us as his children to know when to salute, know when to tighten up, know when to have honor, reverence, respect. Doctrine of divine discipline. Let's look at point number one. Hebrews 12.5 says that unbelievers are not liable. In other words, they can just do whatever they want. Now the Bible tells the unbeliever, you go out here breaking the law, you need to fear the one who can execute capital punishment. I love it in America because we have the Second Amendment which tells us that we can protect ourselves and our families with deadly force. Guns are uh, deadly weapons. They're non-deadly weapons. But firearms are deadly weapons. They're not made to wound. They're made to kill. And uh, our Second Amendment says that we can breathe, we can protect ourselves from the criminal of the street, but we can also protect ourselves from those who would wish to enslave us. In other words, we can protect ourselves from uh, rogue governments. And the Bible says, be wary because there are those out there who can execute capital punishment. Don't break the law, in other words, and that's the same thing Jesus told Peter. Don't draw your sword in a criminal act because those who live by the sword, criminality, will die by the sword like criminals. And so we see that the unbeliever is not restrained by much. He is restrained by the laws of divine establishment. And uh, I don't know if you know it or not, but we're so lax on criminals in America that they're having an escapade. And we're going to have to, in America, if we're ever going to get our freedom back, we're going to have to start killing criminals in mass. Violent crime has to be subdued. And violent criminals have to be put down. Just like you wouldn't keep an animal that was trying to kill your children. You would get rid of it. And if you're going to be free in America, you're going to have to get rid of criminals. I've often thought, well, what is a good situation to have? You know, in England, they sent all of their criminals to Australia. That's what you got over there. There's a bunch of crazy people. They somehow survived over there and they proliferated. And now you have Australians. We don't have a great island to send all of our criminals to. And by the way, God endorses capital punishment. So the unbeliever is he's he's free and wild in the world. And he doesn't have a lot of restraints as far as sin is concerned. He can go out here and sow wild oats. He can do whatever he wants to. He can follow his sin nature. He can get involved in all kinds of sinful activity. And he's not going to reap any consequences as far as divine discipline is concerned. But you, believer, you may sin and you may think you're getting away with it, but you're not. God will let you go out into the faraway land. He'll let you go out there and sow your wild oats, but you're going to hit the end of the rope. You'll find out what this thorny switch is. It's coming. God skins a lion with a whip every son he receives. So, point two, under divine discipline, it's all based on love. Those he loves, he chasteneth. My parents would always tell me when I got a whipping and when I was a kid, 
I'm doing this because I love you. That didn't compute when I was a little kid. You're about to tan my hide because you love me? Now I am very thankful and I know it was done in love. And they, they probably saved my life from being an outlaw, totally. I was only a partial outlaw. I did have some respect for getting caught. And my parents taught me that from my early age. You won't get away with it. They loved me. And God loves you, and he doesn't want you to see you destroy your own life. And uh, he doesn't want to see you hurt others. And sometimes he provides a sin unto death to bring you home early to keep you from being destructive. It is done in love. One thing you need to remember is that when the thorny switch comes, and God begins to strip your skin from your backside with chastening that you, in fact, have not lost your salvation, although you will feel like it. But Galatians 3.26 says that we are sons through faith in Christ Jesus. Hebrews 12 tells us we would be have to be concerned if we didn't receive discipline when we got out in a faraway land because then we might need to question our own faith. But because we do receive discipline, we can be encouraged that God has received us all as sons. Okay, we'll continue next week looking at the doctrine of divine discipline. I want to pray with you. Our Father God in heaven, we thank you that you have received us as your children and that you have sent us discipline along the way not to uh, punish us, but to bring us back home. where We can be in fellowship with you and have all the blessings that you have in store for us. We thank you and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.